Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Reproductive Health Services of Planned Parenthood of the St. Louis region in Southwest Missouri. My name is Yamelzi Rodriguez. I use she, her, ella pronouns, and I am the president and CEO. And in this unprecedented moment in abortion rights, I am so very thankful to be in community this morning with Governor Pritzker, Lieutenant Governor Stratton, Representative Stewart and Greenwood, and your team of allies here who for years have shown us what it looks like to be creative, bold, and unapologetic in protecting and defending patients who need access to abortion. In Illinois, we have been preparing for the day roll falls, and we are ready. Thanks to Governor Pritzker's work to codify abortion rights in this state, we are a safe place not just for Illinoisans, but for anyone who needs abortion in a post roe world. We have done the work in our state, and now it is your turn, Congress. The Senate will try again today to pass the Women's Health Protection Act, which would help protect the rights to abortion throughout the United States and guard against abortion bans and restrictions. We are on the new frontier of abortion access. Since January, through our regional logistics center, we have already navigated nearly a thousand patients from seven states to Southern Illinois. With Hope Clinic for Women and abortion funds and practical support groups in all 50 states, our case managers have arranged travel, lodging, and financial aid for any patient, no matter where they are, who needs logistical support. As providers on the ground, we are pleading for our allies in Congress to take action. Please know that we are running out of time. As we near the end of Roe v. Wade, we are continuing to ask ourselves, what more can we do to protect abortion access in the state of Illinois for any person, no matter their zip code? In partnership with Governor Pritzker's administration, we are working to train and privilege advanced nurse practitioners to provide health care to the full scope of their practice in an effort to scale capacity ahead of the impending surge of patients in the tens of thousands who will be traveling to, from out of state to Illinois seeking abortion care. This is just one example of what we can do and what we need to do to continue forging forward a path so abortion will remain protected and accessible here in the state of Illinois no matter what happens in the Supreme Court. It is now my honor to introduce you to Governor Pritzker who continues to champion abortion access and rights not just for Illinoisans but for anyone coming to our state for abortion care. Thank you, Governor. Thank you very much. Well, thank you so much, Jamelsi, and thank you all for joining us this morning. With the Supreme Court's anti-choice majority poised to further restrict abortion and reproductive rights and overturn Roe v. Wade, the nation is on the precipice of eliminating a federal right that has been the law of the land throughout the United States for 50 years. It's shameful, and it's wrong. Lieutenant Governor Stratton, our partners in the State House who are here, and I want to thank Planned Parenthood for hosting us this morning. But maybe more importantly, for the truly life-saving and life-changing work that they do for patients in Illinois and throughout the United States. We joined together to mark the Regional Logistics Center's opening in January on the 49th anniversary of Roe v. Wade, knowing that Roe's guarantee of a woman's right to choose might not make it to the 50th anniversary. In the months since then, hundreds of patients from other states throughout the South and Midwest have been cared for in this very room that, in which we're standing, recovering not only from their medical procedure, as many patients would, but recovering from the odyssey that forced them to seek refuge here. More than 75% of this clinic's patients are from out of state, coming from places like Oklahoma, Missouri, Texas, and Kentucky, sometimes traveling eight plus hours and hundreds of miles to get basic reproductive care. 
Often these patients have struggled to get the necessary childcare, lodging, and time off work. They're patients who've struggled to find enough money to travel this far. Patients who've had to answer personal questions to their employers or had to invent a reason to be gone for days. Patients who've faced hurdles at every turn in the pursuit of basic health care. And let's be crystal clear about one point. Abortion is health care. By the time many of these out-of-state patients make it to Fairview Heights, Illinois, they have traveled further than anyone should have to, physically and emotionally. People should not have to endure trauma after trauma to be in control of their own bodies. But that's exactly the burden that this right-wing Supreme Court and anti-choice governors and state legislatures increasingly put on the backs of millions of women. Since 2015, the number of out-of-state patients coming to Illinois to make their own decisions about whether, where, and how to, get a par uh, to be a parent has tripled. And without action from Congress, it's set to soar. Let me be extra clear about this. Illinois is a pro-choice state. And as long as I'm governor and we retain a pro-choice legislature, we will support every woman's right to reproductive freedom. When women come here to this state, you are welcomed in Illinois. You are supported. You are safe. You won't need to suffer additional trauma. You'll be treated with dignity and empathy and compassion. To the U.S. Senators who are voting today on whether to safeguard a woman's right to choose, there is no archaic rule, no parliamentary maneuver, no matter what, that is more critical than protecting the lives and bodily autonomy of more than 160 million people. It's long past time for this nation to codify Roe v. Wade into law. If it takes overhauling the filibuster, then overhaul the filibuster. If it requires countless hours of pleading and deliberation, then get to work. If it takes courage, find the courage. My mother fought for women's liberation and reproductive rights, and she showed me how protests can change the minds of politicians who are stuck in the past, and how important it is to turn protest into action. Right now, women are under siege. Basic rights to privacy, to health care, to the rights of women to control their own bodies are about to be stripped away. The world is watching. Here in Illinois, we trust women. To the U.S. Senate, we say, be like Illinois. Thank you, and with that, I'd like to turn it over to a true champion for reproductive rights, my partner in governance in this state, our terrific Lieutenant Governor, Juliana Stratton. Good morning, everyone. I'm Lieutenant Governor Juliana Stratton, and I use she, her pronouns. Thank you, Governor, for that introduction and for your allyship and your strong leadership in protecting reproductive rights. I also want to thank President and CEO Jamel C. Rodriguez and the entire team at, the, at Planned Parenthood of the St. Louis region and Southwest Missouri, the staff and providers here at Fairview Heights, and everyone on the ground providing services and fighting for bodily autonomy. That includes Natalie Clemens, who I commend for standing up to play a role in this work and helping patients access care. No matter the role that you play in this fight, even if you think you're just a small part of it, know that you are making an impact and your work is more important than ever. To show just how true that is, I want everyone in this space to just really look around. Do you see how we're crowded in this room? And now think of the lives, the stories that have come through here. More than 75% of patients who come to this clinic come from other states. That's thousands of people who are desperate, who are scared, who are determined. That's thousands of people who have to overcome tremendous barriers just to receive health care, plain and simple. We know legally 
everyone still has the right to an abortion as of now. It's also true that before any of us knew about the leaked Supreme Court draft opinion, in practice, so many have been forced to jump through hoops to exercise that right. It's a journey that no one should have to make. And yet, as difficult as it is, some would still consider the people who made it here lucky. Because for every person who has to cross state lines to have an abortion, there is someone who could not leave their state, who didn't have the money, the childcare, the time off work to travel. Let me make this clear. The attack on re reproductive rights we are seeing waged by the Supreme Court and by Republicans in states across this country is a threat to the safety and well-being of all of us. And it will only cause further harm for our most vulnerable who have been in the crosshairs of anti-choice legislation for years. Low-income women and black and brown women will bear the brunt of this crisis, having already experienced the devastating effects of inaccessible and inequitable reproductive care. U.S. maternal deaths already rose 14% in 2020. Black women already die at three times the rate of white women. If and when Roe v. Wade is overturned, those numbers will only skyrocket. And we're here today because we refuse to accept that so much death, pain, and trauma can ever be seen as pro-life. We're here today because we listened to women of all backgrounds and perspectives and protected the right to an abortion here in Illinois. And we're here today because no matter what comes next in the weeks and months ahead, we will double down on ensuring that Illinois is a beacon of hope. Everyone everyone should have quality reproductive care near their homes in every state. And when the safe environment you deserve is restricted wherever you are, know that Illinois will step up to be your home for care and welcome you with open arms. We will not be silenced. We will not go back. And as we push forward, we're committing to bring everyone with us. And with that, I would like to thank Representatives Katie Stewart and LaToya Greenwood for joining us, for showing the power of women in leadership as we use our platforms and lift up our voices for all of the women who are unable to do so. And I also want to thank another strong ally in this fight, Senator Chris Belt, and I invite him to come forth to make remarks. Thank you. Good morning. I'd like to thank all of you for inviting me here today. The leaked draft Supreme Court ruling on Roe v. Wade is disheartening. It reflects an attack on all women. Here in Illinois, we have worked to protect people's choices. In Illinois, abortion is a fundamental right. We are a state that supports reproductive rights and women's health. People will have power over their own bodies. Illinois is a safe haven for women because of our leaders who have advocated and fought for this fundamental right. The decision, this decision doesn't, and I underscore doesn't, ban abortions. It bans safe abortions. As I stand here today, I'm reminded the importance of facilities like this one here in Fairview, Fairview Heights, Planned Parenthood. Across the country, low-income women, women of color, and young women could be deprived of their reproductive rights. This is not over. To advocates, leaders, supporters, and elected officials, I thank you and I stand with you as we fight over this fundamental right for women's rights. And with that being said, it is my pleasure and honor to bring to the uh, lectern Representative Katie Stewart. Thank you. Um, thank you, Senator. Thank you, Governor and Lieutenant Governor, for being 
with us today. And thank you to Planned Parenthood for opening your doors uh, and for all the work that you do uh, on behalf of all of your patients every day. Uh, I'm Katie Stewart. I'm the state representative right here in the 112th district. And honestly, I just, I really can't believe that, that we're here, that we needed to have this press conference in this time. I'm glad that we're prepared for this attack on women and their bodily autonomy and self-determination, but still, I just really can't believe it. Let's just be clear, the draft decision is an attack on women. It relegates us to second class status, taking away our ability to make decisions about when to be pregnant and when to have children. It diminishes us as full citizens. I just can't believe that extremist, activist, justices, legislators across the country are undermining decades of settled law and putting the lives of millions at risk. I've had to check the calendar this past week a couple times to remind myself that we actually are in 2022, that the rights that have existed for women for pretty much my entire life, rights that generations before me have fought for, are being eroded all across the country. I really can't believe that we're here in this moment. I'm proud to have supported the Reproductive Health Act to be prepared for a time such as this, to have the protections in place here in Illinois, unlike the states surrounding us. I'm proud to serve in a state that respects women and allows them decision-making powers in terms of the full spectrum of their health care. I'm proud to keep working to make sure women have access to contraception. Measures like HB 135 that we passed in 2021 to allow pharmacists to prescribe birth control. And House Bill uh, 4247, which we passed just this past year, to make emergency contraception available in vending machines on college campuses so that access can be available 24 seven. While Illinois has been a leader in protecting women, and we should be proud of that, we can't become complacent. The draft decision doesn't just dismantle reproductive rights. It challenges the fundamental right to privacy that's contained in the 14th Amendment. Should the final decision strip away that right to privacy, there's much more on the line. Access to birth control, marriage equality, both rely on that right to privacy, as does the decriminalization of homosexual activity. I shudder to think of the gains of the civil rights movement that can be reversed with such a ruling. I just can't believe we're here in 2022, where the fundamental rights of human beings can fall to the whims of extreme activist judges who were rammed through an appointment process by presidents who didn't even win a popular vote. I just can't believe that we've come to this. I'm committed to keep working. I'm committed to making sure that the rights due to every human being aren't methodically stripped away. I'm committed to preserving a woman's right to the full spectrum of health care, including access to abortion and contraception. And I implore our representatives and senators in Washington to pass the Women's Health Protection Act and make sure that we are fully protected and recognized as full citizens. Uh, it is my honor to uh, introduce my colleague, Representative LaToya Greenwood. Thank you and good morning. I'm State Representative LaToya Greenwood from East St. Louis. Thank you uh, to the governor and Lieutenant Governor and all of the staff here at Planned Parenthood and all of my colleagues in the legislature for standing for what is right. In particular for what is right for women here in our state of Illinois. These past two years have amplified the gender, racial, and economic inequities that make it difficult for people to access the health care they need. These same systemic inequities have long blocked access to safe, reproductive health care. With the potential decision to overturn Roe versus Wade, reproductive health for thousands of black and brown women around this state truly will be a matter of life or death. Today and every day, I am standing in support of women. 
This is not simply about abortion, but choice and access to equitable reproductive health care. Sunday, this past Sunday, we celebrated Mother's Day. And all around our nations, we highlighted our mothers. To continue to celebrate mothers, we need to ensure that we have quality health care, affordable child care, ensuring that mothers do not have to watch their children grow up in poverty here in our great state of Illinois. And most importantly, we should be ensuring that no one is for forced to become a mother against her will. In Illinois, we support women, and I am proud, proud to stand with everyone here today in support of women all across our country to say Illinois is your home and you are safe here. I'm proud to bring up next Natalie Clemens. Good morning. My name is Natalie Clemens. I use she, her pronouns. Um, and today I work as a call center associate scheduling appointments for patients who need any reproductive health care, including abortion. But before I started working at Planned Parenthood, I was a patient who accessed abortion in Missouri one year before this Fairview Heights, Illinois Health Center opened. When I see the ease of care and dignity afforded to patients in Illinois, thanks to allies like Governor Pritzker and Lieutenant Governor Stratton, I can't help but to remember the medically unnecessary hoops that I had to jump through in order to access my in-clinic abortion in Missouri. I was 19 years old, about to go to college, and newly single when I learned that I was pregnant despite being on birth control. Parenting was not an option for many reasons, some personal, some medical, but no matter how you cut it, I needed to end my pregnancy and I needed to do it quickly. But in states like Missouri, accessing this basic health care service is anything but quick and convenient. I had to take two trips, sit through state mandated propaganda my doctor was forced to read to me, and of course navigate the financial burden because of private and public insurance bans in the state. If it weren't for abortion funds like the Missouri Abortion Fund and a big sister who had some money in savings, I too would have been banned from a procedure that was and is still legal today. These are the kinds of restrictions that the Women's Health Protection Act would guard against. As we face the impending end of Roe v. Wade, patients like me and those I help at the call center need Congress to act. We all deserve the abortion experience Illinois has offered to patients, the kind that centers medicine and people. As we face the likely end of Roe v. Wade, I urge every elected ally to do more, to do something. Please don't sit by and watch people like me in states across this country suffer at the hands of anti-abortion politicians. All people deserve the leadership we have in Governor Pritzker and his administration. And I wanna thank you, Governor Pritzker, for making the lives of patients better every day, no matter where we travel from. And I would like to welcome him back to the podium to answer some questions. Um, thank you very much, Natalie, and thank you for sharing your story and also for the public service that you're doing for so many women. I'm happy to take any questions from members of the media. Well, this is a pro-choice state. I'm a pro-choice governor. We have a pro-choice legislature. Yeah, we're going to stand up for women's rights and their ability to make decisions for themselves. And I realize that there are uh, legislators and other people in the state who may oppose abortion rights. They don't have to have one then. They can make that choice for themselves. We will expand abortion services, reproductive rights uh, deserve that. We need reproductive services of all sorts available to women, more available now because we no doubt are going to see many more women who are seeking a place of refuge to exercise their rights. And if you look at the map of states that uh, will revert to being anti-choice or already really are, um, this is an island, this state. And can you imagine what it would be like in the country if Illinois was not pro-choice? How far would women have to drive or how hard would it be for them to access these services? So we're going to do everything we can to protect women in the state of Illinois and women who come to the state. Governor, you suggested that senators should engage in that debate about persuading. Is it going to persuade you to do you think you have to work on this? 
a lot of the opposition to abortion is rooted in deeply held religious views that life begins at conception. How do Democrats engage that argument, and when do you believe life begins at conception? Look, I think there are some people who may not be persuadable. I think we all would agree. Um, and that's one of the reasons why I, it is very important for people to get out to vote. We have a pro-choice majority in this nation and in this state, and we need people to go out and exercise their right to vote, to vote in people who will stand up for their constitutional rights. Um, so, I, I, look, I, I know we're not going to convince somebody like Ted Cruz to change his position, uh, but we could replace Ted Cruz um, in the United States Senate. So. Uh, we, we all need to do our part to make advances to protect women's rights. And I want to make one more point clear, because what they're debating is just protecting reproductive rights. That's what they're debating. By the way, it also there will be a debate, no doubt, by the other side about restricting reproductive rights for everyone, including people in Illinois. So there's going to be a, a clash of ideas. There's no doubt about it. But remember that this decision that might happen that has been uh, suggested by the, the uh, draft uh, decision on Roe v. Wade. Uh, this decision will not just take away people's reproductive rights. It also threatens their right to birth control. It also threatens their right to marriage equality. It also threatens all of the precedents that have been established around the privacy rights that were codified in Roe v. Wade. So I'm very concerned, very concerned, even beyond the protection of reproductive rights. So I hope that that debate is successful for protecting reproductive rights, but I also hope that they recognize that they're going to have to protect a lot more rights when this radical right-wing uh, Supreme Court rules against Roe v. Wade. So let me start with, we already support uh, the clinics that are around the state that provide reproductive rights. Um, we certainly want, are continuing to increase the support for women in state in addition to the support that we provide directly to clinics um, and in support of the regional logistics efforts to um, make sure that people coming from out of state have the resources that they need. We are looking at whether or not we can provide state dollars for out-of-state uh, people directly to help them. Um, but indirectly, we absolutely already are doing that. Oh, I could give you a number. I don't have one right here, but it, we are quite a lot of money is dedicated to, particularly to uh, directly to the providers themselves. We, we've changed the formula for reimbursing providers here in the state. Actually, when I became governor, we increased that formula. Um, and we've continued to support in that way. But I'll get you a direct number. And can I just do one follow-up? Yes. Uh, as you know, many legislatures are not stopping state lines when it comes to reimbursement. That's right. Laws. Are you doing anything that will prevent abortion providers from being criminalized by other states? We are looking at, I have actually engaged the Attorney General's office as well as my own general counsel's office in the legislation that we might be able to put together to protect people from being sued or being held criminally liable uh, for performing uh, reproductive rights procedures in the state of Illinois. It seems to me that that is something that also is going to be litigated through the courts because it, it, it is ridiculous to me that you could have this kind of cross-border attack on people in the state of Illinois. So we're going to do everything everything within our power to protect our providers and to protect people who are seeking to get the services they deserve. Well, the, the Connecticut governor just signed yeah. something into law that would do just that for their providers. And it's a question, I have to say, this is also going to be litigated. So we're trying to make sure that we're looking at the C Connecticut law as well as making adjustments that we think might be even better to protect the providers. Well, can I just ask you to ask you about the Kentucky Of course. Law?
Yeah, thank you for, for asking how we, right, as abortion providers are, are feeling. Um, I would say that the, you know, we ran the whole gamut of emotions over the, the last week, even though we have been preparing, right? We operate in a bi-state region, so we are lucky to have champions like Governor Spritzker and his administration who have done everything they can to expand and protect acts to abortion, but we have also been operating the last standing abortion clinic in the state of Missouri. And it is unfortunate, right, that even without having to overturn Roe, abortion has been basically decimated in the state of Missouri because unnecessary restrictions and challenges like Natalie um, alluded to. So while we were angry and we were shocked, we were also not um, completely taken back because this is what we've been, you know, sounding the alarms for, for, for a long time. So while we are clearly, you know, devastated specifically for those women around the country that even though we have a regional logistic center and we're offering financial assistance, travel, um, lodging, and, and childcare su support, we are really concerned for those women who are never going to be able to navigate their way around to a state like Illinois. And I think it's, it's for us, it's critically important to remind everyone around the country that abortion, it's still legal for now. If you have um, an appointment at an abortion health center, please show up. If you are in need of abortion care, please call um, your um, abortion provider. And I think we are also um, ensuring, as I mentioned earlier, right, that we're increasing capacity, that we are well prepared and equipped to see an influx of all up to 14,000 patients traveling to the health center we're here today um, in Illinois as they have to just flee their home state to access essential, basic, safe health care. I think the safety and security of, of our staff and the patients that walk through our doors are always our first priority. And we will continue to ensure that anybody that is walking through through our doors can just feel, of course, welcome, um, but also safe. And we have been doing that and preparing for that um, time. And you know, even when we opened this health center, right, we were very strategic in ensuring that we were opening the health center in secret to also protect those construction um, contractors and, and vendors to make sure that this health center was going to be open and, and ready for what we thought at the time was going to be just an influx of patients from Missouri flying to Cronian, um, egregious restrictions. But what we are seeing, and we have seen this after SB8, the Texas abortion ban went into effect, is that this set health center is going to become, as Governor Pritzker alluded to, a, a safe haven, right? An oasis for reproductive health for women from the South and the rest of the Midwest. Well, if they attack anybody, peaceful protest, always welcome, exercising your First Amendment rights, always appreciated and uh, supported, even if we disagree. But beyond that, if there are physical attacks, if there are threats that are made, uh, we will hold people responsible. We will imprison people. We will hold them responsible, and they will go to jail. Uh, if they do anything that's illegal and attack anybody uh, that's either attempting to come to a uh, clinic or someone who works at a clinic. Uh, that's vitally important that we protect them. And I, of course, have both the state police available to me and the ab ability to use to, to talk to the attorney general um, and engage his services in, in helping to protect these clinics. Yeah, and I, can I add one thing before you ask your final question? Um, uh, it strikes me it's worth mentioning for all of you that um, as of yesterday, we understand that a, uh, one of the clinics in Tennessee is now looking to open a, an outpost here in Carbondale, here in Illinois, uh, to provide abortion services for people who need to come all the way from Tennessee 
as a result of the restrictions that are already being placed in Tennessee and their expectation of the Roe v. Wade um, overturning. So, yes, sir. Obviously, every life of a child, and particularly vulnerable children, um, are lives that deserve protection and that we should do everything to respond to and reduce the number every year. Um, as you know, there's a report that comes out, that's where that number comes from, that comes out every year from the Inspector General, um, and it's one that gets delivered to the department, uh, and it shows all of the deaths that have occurred during that prior year of anybody that's come in contact at any point with DCFS. So those include things like kids drowning or um, kids who um, even accidental uh, circumstances like a car accident or something else. Um, so that's included in that number that you're referencing. Um, there are a, a small, much smaller number that are uh, situations of severe neglect or abuse. Um, those are very serious to us. We investigate those deeply. We make sure that we hold accountable the people who are responsible. Uh, very often it's the caretaker or someone that the caretaker knows um, that is responsible for a death like that. And so we're doing everything we can to investigate those, to prosecute people uh, that are committing those crimes. Um, and then more broadly, we have investigative services to make sure that we're protecting kids from ever having that happen to them. So that number of kids that's, you know, less than a, a dozen, those, any number is awful. Um, those number of kids, you know, th those are situations we're trying to reduce every year, working on, you know, significantly reducing that. Um, and every other one of those deaths. We, I'll just give you one side example. We have a number of kids each year who die um, in sleep-related situations. So perhaps a baby, we all know about SIDS, for example. Um, these are things that we can work diligently on making sure that caregivers know how to protect those babies or young children um, to make sure that they don't suffocate, they roll over. I mean, I don't know if you have a child, but you know, um, we all need to make sure that babies are kept face up when they're sleeping or at least are in situations where they can't suffocate. So. Um, so this is all work that we're doing every year. We look, I look at that report, I read that report every year, and we work diligently on making sure that we don't repeat anything that happens or you know, that we give the education that's necessary uh, to the caregivers themselves. Yes, one more right here. Just, just one yes, more on abortion yes, of course. Um, Indeed, uh, even on the way in the door here, uh, Jim Elsey and I were talking exactly about expanding uh, advanced practice uh, nurses and allowing them to, to you know, be available to perform these procedures, um, something that Illinois is different than some other states about and that a change that we likely need to make. Look, again, I will look for every opportunity to protect women, to give women the ability to get their rights exercised in this state, uh, no matter where they are, whether they're from Illinois or somewhere else. So yes, that's just one example. And we also need to, uh, as we have, provide scholarships and other uh, support for women who, and men, by the way, uh, men and women in the nursing profession, um, and to have them enter in the profession, in the pipeline, and make sure that we're producing more healthcare providers uh, in general. Right. Yep. Thank, Thank you. you.